great thing, of course, about being an actress is that you play parts of people who maybe you would always have always wanted to be and could never be. When you were studying acting, though, you really thought of yourself as a stage actress, didn't you? Yeah. Initially. How did you make that transition? How did you end up from that notion of going on the stage and being an actress, being a theater actress, into ending up in, in the motion pictures? Well, because finally it's a job. Finally you get an offer. I, was a, I mean, I was a kid when I was 18 years old when I was offered this <clears throat> screen test yeah. by Howard Hawks. I was doing photographic modeling for a while, not very long. Uh, and Hawk saw my picture and offered me this test. It just seemed it's another opportunity, so why not do it? Try it. And then, of course, with my imagination and my great fantasy life, I thought, oh my gosh, my name's going to be in life. I'm going to meet Betty Davis. I'm going to be, you know, all that yeah. stuff. So. When he did the test, did he do it in New York or did he bring you out to California for mm. it? California. And I was a nervous wreck, of course. But he, on seeing the test, decided that it was worth taking a small chance on me and putting me under personal contract. The thing is that Hawks, my good fortune was that Howard Hawks happened to be a director who had always wanted to create a star yes. out of an unknown. Yes. And he'd had this little Svengali side to him. And who am I to say no to a thing like that? You talk about him as, as a Svengali, very appropriate way. He saw you, fell in love with you, if we, can, if we can phrase it that way. He just loved what he saw and he said, I see a movie star here. But he said, you have... If I can make her into a movie star. Well, he saw the potential for um, a movie star. I have heard people, uh, specifically actresses, talk about this kind of experience. Occasionally it happens. It's generally with anger and even bitterness. You talk about him with such affection. I mean, in, in your yeah. eyes, I see affection. I was for very him fond of him. I was terrified of him at the beginning when I was a kid. I was really frightened of him. He was furious that I went off with Bogart because I, he lo I mean, then he sold my contract to Warner's. He said, the hell with her. I mean, do you think part of it was a, or an affection that he had, I mean, beyond the professional respect? Oh, sure. And that there definitely. was a real well, jealousy he had... Well, I think it was male ego, created definitely, a lot of it. And suddenly, <laughs> she went off with this guy here, with this actor of all people. And, and, he was ne and he always told me, Bogart, and he said, Bogart will never marry you. It'll take you to a, you know, forget it. He'll, he's going to stay where he is. And I said to Bogey, he says she'll never marry me, Bogey. Tears. <laughs> No, he, um... Did he at least send you a wedding present? Or? No. Oh, no. He was not happy with me. He washed his hands of me. It was a strange thing about Howard, you know. Once he was done, that's it. And to have and have not, he told you about how you had to present yourself. And I think I was reading, remember you were talking before about how you would tremble. You would always tremble. Yeah. And so you had to figure out a way to do this thing and to not show the trembling. And out of that, out of the necessity to do that, actually came the look. Oh, well, yes, because I was so nervous all the time. I'm a nervous wreck anyway. But I was so nervous that I shook. I literally shook. I couldn't, I had to light a cigarette and I would light the cigarette like this and then my head was shaking and I, I, I really got into trouble. I finally had to figure out a way not to constantly shake. And I finally, arrived at this by accident in a scene where if I lowered my head I found I could keep it steady mm -hmm. and just move mm -hmm. my eyes thanks it was all to create this persona that Hawks had in his head that of course had nothing to do with the kind of a person I was the interesting thing was when to have and have not came out got a terrific reception. I mean, a tremendous reception. Oh, yes. Particularly indeed. you got a great reception. And people compared you to the great Betty Davis and to Marlene Dietrich. In fact, to every great star, they said, this is Lauren yes. Bacall. And I was Mae West, and I was that's Garbo, right. and I <laughs> that's was right. everybody all rolled into one. Right. Now, that's which terrific. Which no one can ever possibly be. 
that's what I would think. What's the downside of you that when the expectations the, are that high? Well, the downside is that you can only crash. I mean, there's no way that you can live up to that. Critics, you see, tend to put actors, new people, they put you on a pedestal and they can't wait to knock you down. And uh, it's one of the uh, pitfalls of, of our profession and it's very unfair. And that's why when, when Confidential Agent was released, I mean, the critic, the same critics yeah. that said I was the best thing they'd ever seen, brilliant, funny, blah, 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 suddenly said, we were, stop the presses, yeah. send her away. Yeah. They were really cruel. And I never forgot that experience. It's almost as if they said, all right, we made her, we can break her. Yeah. Let's, take, let's take the well, woman down. Well, one hopes that that's her. not the way they think, but of course... The insensitivity, first of all, you cannot put anyone on such a pedestal. You cannot say that someone is the second coming. I mean, I was Dusa, I was Burn. I don't know, I was everything. Yeah, you're larger than life. And yeah. how, how can you be that? You can never live up to that. You can yeah. never repeat it. And first of all, you can never have the impact that you have the first time. It yeah. can never be the same. And so that, that you know, just, just that alone is enough to... I would, I would hope that critics would think a little bit. They don't. They're very cruel to actors. Right, but then they're also very human, and, and there's a certain... Are amount, they? Yes. Show I, me a critic that's human, yeah. and I'll show you. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> but I, and human in the sense of I think there's a certain envy there, and the feeling of, well, wait a minute, I wrote about this person. I, I think most of her. them are failed writers. I've always thought that most, Pretty many critics could not succeed either as novelists, as playwrights, as screenwriters, screenwriters yeah. and uh, that that is one of their great frustrations and this is their chance to get even. Now, what was it that Bogart told you specifically? I mean, you were a kid, literally a teenager, and suddenly you see these glowing reviews. Did he say to you, wait a minute, let me make a suggestion on how you deal with this stuff? Because he was, he was a veteran. Well, well, what he always said to me was, don't believe everything you read. I mean, Bogey always said, you know, that they uh, don't believe the good and don't believe the bad because yeah. they make it up as they go along. And uh, Also, I think if you're going to believe the good stuff, which is very tempting, because it feels good, it just yeah. feels good. It's well, like you have drug. to believe the bad. Right. Then you, yeah. you have to be prepared for when they're going to kill you. Because yeah. sooner or later, as you told me now, they're going to kill you. Yeah. The interesting thing was on the third film, you were their darling again. You made a very good film. You did very fine work. The big Sleep. Yeah, Big Sleep comes out and they say, all right, okay, well, forget what we said the second time <clears> around because as a matter of fact, Bacall has bounced back showing us that her talent has come to maturity. Yes, but whatever. they'd already done their damage. Yeah, they'd already done the hatchet job on you. And I spent 20 years climbing up there again. And, of course, I never recaptured that, that excitement that was the, my beginning. Yeah. Never. Yeah. And I never will. Yeah. There is a general sense you have that people have, and it sounds self-serving and it sounds like a cliché, that they don't make movies like they used to. But to a large extent, I think that's true, that there was a period that was wonderful. Even when I was looking through your films, you did a film called How to Marry a Millionaire. Mm. Now, it's not Citizen Kane, but it was a wonderful film. It was a it was also film. It also happened to have been the first CinemaScope film completed, and Daryl Zanuck did not want it to get the credit for being the first one that was finished. He wanted the robe, which he produced, to be the yeah. first CinemaScope. So that's the way that was released and Millionaire was not. Now you also wrote that you liked working in the CinemaScope form, CinemaScope form being a wide angle format. I didn't like the way it looked. What I liked about it was the fact that you could play a complete scene. I see. The good thing about it was that you had to, because of the widescreen, you had to like be on the stage. Yeah. You had to play a whole scene and move around. You had to keep moving. You couldn't stay too still on CinemaScope because the proportion was so awful. And it was so elongated yeah. that you, in order to fill the screen, you had to move to different, you know, <laughs> to this end and the other one moved to that. So, so it, wasn't the, it wasn't the look of it that I liked. The look was not pretty. It was not, not flattering. It wasn't becoming at all. But the process of yeah. 
being able to go through a scene from the beginning, the middle, and the end is, was terrific for me. Yeah. I did better that way. I felt better playing a scene that way. Well, it's closer also to a sort of proscenium art staging, isn't it? Yes. And it's closer yeah. to real life where you're not limited by the constraints the of the theater. screen. Yeah, absolutely. One of the interesting things that I was reading about in the reaction to the book, to your uh, autobiography, it's got an excellent response. Yeah. That more mail came to you that talked about your relationship with your mother than about your relationship with Bogart. Still, yeah. I get it now. And that that was particularly gratifying because that was, that was at the heart of what the book was about and you wanted people to understand that and that that was who you were and that it had been years after Bogart's death that people couldn't get past that relationship as, cru as critical as it was to you. Yeah. And you were trying to say, yes, of course I, I adored him and vice versa. But I'm a person, and I have a career, and I have a point well, of view. Well, it still exists. It's never going to change. The only reason that I object to the, uh, the bogey thing now is that it makes me feel that that was the only, not only identity that I had, but the only worthy thing about my life, and I don't feel that's true. I don't think anybody who's looked at your films feels that. Well, I no, you. I think a lot of people don't feel that, but yeah. there are people that do feel it. And I mean, that's, uh, I'm not complaining about it, I'm just saying that that is something that will never go away. I mean, I myself think, you know, a, a lot about Bogey. I mean, he's, well, he, he made an incredible, oh, mark on my life. I mean, he will never, uh, I mean, more than anyone else has, certainly, except my mother, obviously. But I mean... Bogey, because it was also so connected with, with my work, and because my work continues, and because Bogey continues in the minds of, of the young, of new, now generations, it's, uh, he's still very much here. Do you remember when you first met Bogart? Oh, oh yeah. Remember that first moment on that first film? No, I met him before the first. Uh, before to have and have not I met him Howard Hawks he was making a movie called Passage to Marseille that uh, Mike Curtiz was directing and Howard Hawks brought me on the set mm -hmm. to in introduce me to him one day this was before I tested for to have and have not and uh, I guess Bogey knew I was going to test Howard must have talked to him I don't know but in any event it was just how do you do how do you do how do you do and how do you do no uh, no palpitations, I can tell you. I mean, I thought, <laughs> you know, it's Bogart, great. How you do? Nice to meet you. I was, you know, I was impressed because I knew, you know, he was a good actor and everything, but he was certainly not a hero of mine. Yeah. And uh, then I tested for it. Then I got the part. And then the next time I saw him before we started to make the movie was I was heading into Howard Hawks' office and he was coming out. And he said, I just saw your test. He said, we'll have a lot of fun together. <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, I hope so. Little did I know, <laughs> of course. Did he tell you later on that he thought that you were very attractive beyond just being a, do you know that there was like a click, like a chemistry for him at that moment? Or were you just one more you know, attractive woman who passed by? Oh, I don't think he, no, I don't think he thought about any of it until we started to work and suddenly it all just kind of happened. How did oh, your mom she was feel? not thrilled. She was less than thrilled. She was less than thrilled with the man who was her age. Yeah. And who had had three wives. She was not too happy about this that. This was not the dream for her daughter. No, not her beautiful, perfect daughter. Yeah. But it was, uh, she was tough about him at the beginning. And, and when they first met, oh God, their first meeting was so awful. Why? Because they, they were both at war with each other because Bogey didn't want to be judged and he resented the fact that she judged him and she looked at him and said, all right, so what have you got to offer my daughter that's so great? That's what's going on in her mind, you know. This beautiful young, young girl. Why wouldn't you adore her? Beautiful young girl. Yeah, everybody adores her. Yes. I adore my her. My right. beautiful daughter. No, you know, I was everything to my mother. But then, of course, once it was a fact, they became such good friends. Really? They were so good. Crazy. I mean, literally, really crazy about one another. It was wonderful to see. You once said that you felt that the studios never took you seriously as an actress. Um, 
that, and sometimes they would think of you as Bogart's wife, or whatever, and they liked you, but they that they didn't give you the kind of roles no, that you could have done. Yeah. And I dare say you could have done very well, because they didn't think of you in that sense. That's right. That's absolutely correct. No, I was thought of as Bogie's wife. As soon as we were married, I was Bogie's wife. I was not offered uh, wonderful parts, and. Uh, that's why I took How to Marry a Millionaire, actually, because it was the first really good part that I was offered. You know, I had to test for that. Really? Yeah. I was quite horrified that I did, but I did. Because they said they'd never seen me in a comedy before on screen. I've had a very weird career, you know. That was my first movie, 20th Century Fox. Were you under contract with them? Or no. did you do individual projects with individual. them? Individual. And then I was in A Woman's World for Fox. Let's talk about that one. There was a premise of that film. It was very interesting. It was that, and the kind of woman you played there, I thought she was very interesting. Yeah. The notion was here was a woman who was the woman behind the man. This was a lot about corporate America in the 50s, yes, wasn't it? Yes, yes, yes it was. And that uh -huh. who you were depended a lot about who your wife was in terms of a man. You, you didn't even think of female executives. It was male executives. Fred McMurray, McMurray was a And it was executive. also, yes, the man that was going to be chosen to be the head guy in a corporation. Right. And he, the three men were brought to the corporation so that the head of the corporation could test all of them. Right. And, and their wives were there so that he could evaluate the wives right. as a sort of appendage, almost, I felt, like a decoration. To, uh, to well, the but also to see the kind of influence they had on their husbands and to mm -hmm. see whether they would be a plus or a minus in the job. Poor Katie Baxter. She just couldn't do anything right. Her husband is probably the best man for the job, too. Well, what about me? Oh, you do just as well for a while, till the job killed you. I like that, Bill Baxter. I like the way he left Gifford flat because his wife needed him. I bet they've worked it out so they're pretty happy. With him, it doesn't have to be all job and no family. I can see a thread through these Bacall characters. Very bright. Very sharp. Um, and well, yet... they've done this to me. <laughs> they've made me so bright and so sharp that Has that's all anyone thinks I can do. Be bright and sharp. I've seen a good range I'm of things. I must be chic and I must here. be glamorous and I must be always in control. Well, how would you like them? For, I mean, you couldn't have been playing dumb dumb parts no it's not you. but no it, it but i would i would i don't like pigeonholes it's it's very limiting when you think back on the roles did you ever turn down a role maybe because they said you've got to come in and read for it or whatever but did you ever turn something down and then been sorry later yes one part in particular, Otto Preminger wanted me to be in The Man with a Golden Arm, and I turned it down, because he wouldn't pay me, and that was stupid. I learned, a, I, I mean, I learned a very hard lesson, because it was a good movie, it was a yeah. good part, yeah. he would have been good to work with, and Why because he, well, because you know, you, there are always producers that think they'll get you for less. This is what we pay you, and this is all we can afford, and then, you know, and, and I was always taught that you have to be very careful in the business, because once you lower your price, then you never get it up again, and, you know, all that stuff that goes on, which I think is really baloney. Yeah, that's called the conventional wisdom. In yeah, I think it's ridiculous. I yeah. mean, for some people, all right, you do it because you want to work with them, so you do it for less. If that's the way you want to do it, and then the others, if they want you, they have to pay more, and if they don't like it, tough bananas, you know. But I didn't feel that way then, and I wasn't secure enough then to, to make that choice. And I, I, was wrong. I was wrong. I was sorry about that. I regretted that. However, that's life. Yeah. You said Just it. one more mistake, you know. <laughs> Let's say you were to do a film. Let's say at the point where you start to look back on your career 20, 25 years from now, okay? And the film is called Bacall on Bacall. Oh, my God. No, a no, horrible no. horrible thought. A horrible... Oh, no, I think it's a nice thought. And I... Okay. I don't have the money for it yet, so you're going to give me a while. Now, but the first thing you've got to do for me to go out and raise the money for this is I want you to give me three scenes. Huh? Three scenes that you would put... Now, remember... That what? I don't care what... That, that you loved. I loved Orient Express. Yeah. I mean, that was... 
really exciting to be in, really fun. You had the killer character. I know. Mrs. Hubbard. <laughs> she's one of Harriet, my favorite. H for Harriet. She's H one of for my favorite Bacall characters. Uh, I mean, wonderful. from the moment you see Harriet her, she knows Hubbard. this is a lady who comes in and takes charge and makes everybody's life miserable. And it was, I mean, it was lovely, though. Your handkerchief, Mrs. Hubbard. And that's not mine. I have mine right here. Oh, I, uh, I thought the initial A. H for Harriet, H for Hubbard, but it's still not mine. Mine are sensible things, not expensive Paris frills. What good's a hanky like that to anybody? One knees and it has to go to the laundry. <laughs> Knowing what you do now, if you could go back uh, to Betty Bacall, a teenager in Brooklyn years ago, just starting out exploring the world, a world of wonderment. I mean, whose biggest hero was Betty Davis on the screen? who could never have imagined that she would be in Hollywood and on the screen and married to Bogart. But if you could sit down and have a conversation with that 15-year-old, what is it you would like to tell her? What wisdom would you maybe like to share with her? I would just, I, my only advice would always be, if you think that there's something else you, you can do, would be just as happy doing, do it. Because... It's not an easy life you're choosing for yourself. I told that to my own son, Sam, you know. I mean, Sam is an actor. He's the only one of my children that's an actor, and he's a hell of a good actor. Now, Sam works in the motion picture industry of the 90s, as do you. You go, you do a book, I you do better. a play, you do a movie. You Damn work right. Out. How is it making difference now in the 90s than it was in the 40s? Well, number one, at the moment, uh, it's much tougher for women. Tougher now? Yeah tougher now. Huh. There are not good parts being written. There are not a lot of parts being written. <laughs> I mean, look at the books. Look at the plays. Yeah. You know, movies, when I went into movies, were very much a woman's business. Women were the women stars. Just think of the women stars. And we're talking pre-feminist movement. Oh, we're talking absolutely. about a time when there wasn't even well, a I mean, word. Yeah, there was Betty Davis, there was Catherine Hepburn, there was Garbo, there was Dietrich, there was Norma Shearer. I mean, Betty Grave, Alice Bay, endless, endless, endless movie stars, women. I think movie stars were made by the studio system because you were seen in often enough, and, and if directors or producers came along with terrific parts, you were given those parts, and I think the studio system is missed to a degree because of that. If I give you a phrase, a good director, a good director for Lauren Bacall, what does someone have to do to qualify, given your standards and given your experience, to be a really good director? Well, I think, number one, I think respect for actors is important. Uh, I think a director that really likes actors as opposed to resenting them and resenting the fact that their name's up there and that they have, you know, they, they get this and I don't get that, you know. I think that's a very important requirement because automatically you have an exchange and a connection. And also it instills trust in an actor. Actors are, despite anything you may have heard or have witnessed yourself, actors are generally insecure. Uh, most of us hide behind the characters that we play. And we need TLC. Yeah. And we and I don't mean pampering and all that garbage, you know. I'm not talking about the size of the dressing room and all that stuff. I mean we need to feel certainly that the, that the director believes in us, thinks that we that we have talent and encourages us to be better. Yeah. Only by trusting a director will an actor take chances. Uh sure you won't change your mind about this. Uh-huh. This belongs to me and so do my lips. I don't see any difference. Oh, I do. Okay. You know you don't have to act with me, Steve. You don't have to say anything and you don't have to do anything. Not a thing. Oh, maybe just whistle. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow.
The thing is that you have to just hang in there and keep going.